I can um, share this on Facebook, but I don't see that. Let me see if I can do this. Um, it's supposed to be a more down here. I don't see it. Um, so we're just going to have to do uh, the good old fashioned um, announcement over there because people, I don't know why, they just, uh, they forget that we're over here. So give me just a second here, guys. We're going to do something really fun today, too. So I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, let's see here. Can I do this? Let me see if I can jump over here and use this camera. Okay, we're we're getting in there. We we got people coming, so good to go. Awesome. Hello, Matthias, Tim. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hey, we got something really cool here today. I can't wait to show you guys this. This is pretty. Good morning, good morning. We got something um, I think everybody will enjoy, actually. I hope everybody's safe and not sick. And I ventured out to the grocery store yesterday, first time in a long time. And I was happy to find that it wasn't the chaotic mess that I remembered it to be a few weeks ago, where everyone was panic shopping and buying toilet paper and doing all that crazy stuff here. So I was really happy to see that uh, made me made me feel a little bit better about what's going on. So uh, we're a few minutes early yet, so I'm just going to give it some, a little a couple of minutes here. Um, today we got something really cool to show you. Like I said, the uh, the continuing on kind of the pigment pro, uh, pigment uh, processes. Um, um, and I'm going to show you a piece that I did on gouache yesterday. I'll show you the video of it, making of it. It's really cool. I've done carbon on glass. Um, uh, I've never done oil on glass, and I wanted to try that. And uh, Doug Darling mentioned, um, what was it, Wednesday, I guess. God, these days go by so fast, I can't believe it. He mentioned, hey, can you do this on glass? And I was like, well, that's interesting you asked that because that's what I was gonna do on Saturday. So I got my, I want a tattooed president t-shirt on today. Can you see that? I like that t-shirt, it's pretty cool. How you doing, Tim? I'm, I'm fine, how are you? Excellent, never been better. Good. Yeah. I have a question about- Healthy and happy. I have a question that probably no one else cares about, so I ask it now, if that's okay. Do it. Um, on super duper heavy maintenance on your silver bath every yeah. three years ago, I have probably three and a half liters that I've been trying to get all the crap out of it. And I, I did the, th I did just exactly what the formula says to do. I raised the pH. Yeah. Um, and there was a ton of crap in the bottom, right? Let, let me ask you a question. Stop you right there yeah. just for a second. When yeah. you, um, added the distilled water to raise the ph take that ph down get it closer to neutral to seven did you see did it go milky and gray when you did that i didn't add water oh what did you do what did you do okay so i had my silver bath and i started adding bicarbonate uh baking soda Ooh, you're gonna get some foamy stuff there Oh, yes. And you have to be careful. <laughs> Remember the old chemistry, high school chemistry, uh, volcanoes that we made? Basics because and acids. I was, I was dealing with such a large volume and trying yeah. to get it to six or seven yeah. that I started getting it. I'm a very impatient person, so I got impatient. And I started just dumping this stuff in there. And yeah, it went, it went everywhere. So Oh, my I goodness. Started, Oh, yeah. So anyway, I raised the pH six or seven ish. And then I sunned it for, I don't know, six years. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I, um, I filtered that crap out of there. And then I lowered the pH using nitric acid and um, got it down to a pH of around four. Yeah. And sunned it some more and then did a test plate. And 
I got an image. It was a great image, but there was all kinds of streaks and crap and yellow, yellow rivers and streaks on it. So I figured there's still uh, bicarbonate in there. There's still um, ni um, cadmium nitrate and what's the other one? Ammonium nitrates in yeah. there. Yeah. So I kept, I, I, now I just keep sunning it and sunning yeah. it and sunning it. And every time I think it's ready, I test it's it not. and it's not ready. Yeah. Here's the thing, Tim. So okay. in that three and a half liters, how much yeah. by weight do you think you put uh, bicarbonate in? How much baking soda? Oh my soda? gosh. Holy, okay, you're supposed to add. A tablespoon or um, two. Well, you're, I, I, I used 100 cc's of distilled water. With the baking soda. That. Yeah. And I can't remember how many grams of bicarbonate added to that, but I ended up using probably two of those 100 cc containers of this uh, base. Yeah, so, I would be, I, here's what's happening. You're exactly right. What's happening is the bicarbonate is uh, binding and precipitating the silver or the uh, byproducts or the, the, the uh, double yeah, replacement nitrate. process. And that's what's yes. creating anytime you see yellows, anytime you see that, that's iodides. What I recommend people doing is if you start out, let's just say you have a liter, just as a, as a good example. If you have a liter of silver nitrate you need to do heavy maintenance on, uh, take that liter. I have a, a big uh, glass cookie jar that I use. Two liters, yeah, three right. liters, I can fit in there, no problem, too. I just add about a, I try to do less than a third of the total volume of distilled water. So when I start pouring distilled water in there, and people see this all the time, I get emails on it all the time. Oh my God, I just topped off my silver bath. It's all milky and, and, and blue milk in there. And what, what's happening there is you're precipitating that excess iodide out of the bath. That's what and if you put more silver nitrate in there, that'll, that'll precipitate, absorb it, and it'll go clear again. Or you can just wait sometimes and that'll clear. But in maintenance, what you're trying to do is you're trying to bring that pH up. So you're diluting it with water. And then you add a tiny bit of baking soda, some, some alkaline, basically. <laughs> uh, uh, baking soda or ammonia or something that, that you know, and I, I caution people on the ammonia, but, um, and bring that as close to pH seven as neutral as you can, because then when you sun it, what happens in that neutral environment, you're going to pull all those byproducts out. You're going to pull all the nasty stuff out of it. You're aerating it and getting all the solvents out of it, the alcohol and the ether, and you're binding up that ammonium nitrate and cadmium nitrate. And if you don't do that, if you add, or if you do that, you add straight uh, basics or alkaline like you did, you're going to, continue to bind that stuff up over and over and over again. A little bit of that goes a very, very long way in a silver oh. test. So, so you can save that though. You can do it. What I'd recommend you doing is go back to the beginning again. Add, uh, if you, did you say you had three and a half liters? About. Okay. About. So I'd add, I'd start with a liter of distilled water, maybe a little less, 800 mils. Add that. Okay. Um, and then allow that, I would just continue to sun that. What that will do, will it, it'll start binding up. It'll give some space to get that, that alkaline out of there. And the, actually those okay. precipitates out of there. Okay. And you'll continue to get stuff coming out. Every, you'll, you'll just continue to get that for a while. Um, yeah, once you overdo it on the alkaline, it, you can, I've done it. I've learned the hard way too. Um, it just takes a little longer to get it out. And so, so how long in this colder weather, cooler weather, if it's a bright sunny day, but it's 40 degrees outside, I still can sun it? Absolutely. That's perfect. I mean, we're, we're, so, Tim and I live in Colorado, by the way, guys. Um, so we're up way high in elevation, five, 6,000 feet, you know, at minimum. Um, and where I sun mine, I'm up 5,700 feet above sea level. I can go out and put my big cookie jar. Let me show you my cookie jar. This is what I use. Um, I don't use the, the lid on it, of course, but this is what I recommend people. I don't use the lid, but I have the lid, of course. Uh, I recommend, that's what I use. Just a big okay. oh, a container like that. And a, a leader only does that. So I could, I could do yours in here easily, right? 
yeah, um, yeah. I put it out and I don't even cover it up anymore. I don't care if a bug or two gets in there. We, right. we have so few bugs anyway. But You're going to filter it anyway. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of silly that way. So I put it out. I don't care if it's 30 degrees or 40 degrees or 50 degrees. Obviously, okay. in the summertime when it's 80 or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 30, 32 degrees uh, Celsius, it's going to go fast. What you'll, the advantage you'll get there is you'll get mass evaporation, a lot more evaporation. Sure. Which, sure. And that, that's great for, for, for having the uh, solvents come Pleasure. out of the solution. That's wonderful. But what you're after right now is that UV. And, and temperature wouldn't matter. So um, get it out there in the sun. You'll get through that uh, really Okay, thank good. you so much. That's really helpful. I'll try Yeah, it. Yeah, and it's a, it's a common problem. Um, over alkaline, putting too much, uh, you know, basics and acids, right? Putting too much basics and your bath is pretty acidic, you know, if you're around four. Um, putting a basic in there straight off without starting to neutralize it and pulling some of those, freeing some of those iodides up anyway, um, you're going to get that volcano effect. And if you put too much in it, you're going you're gonna to spend some time. But you can, definitely, don't, you can definitely save that three and a half liters. Good morning, Phil. You're right on time. We're just answering, uh, answering questions. Is, is, is he in here? Yeah, I think so. So everybody, let's let's jump back. Hey, hey, Kareem, good to see you guys. That's awesome. I just looking at everybody here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, so I think we're gonna start. We're on time. Everybody's uh, looks like we got a nice crowd here. Um, there's Jeffrey. Welcome. There's Linda, Mario, Phil, John, Jan, Andre, John, John, Thilo. Good, good, and Tim. Of course, we were just talking to. You. Good to see everybody. We're gonna do something fun today. It's gonna, to, this is this is gonna blow your mind. This is so much fun. I have, um, you know what? Maybe I can find this. Let me let me just pull this up real quick. I have in the past, I love pigment prints. We know that that's kind of the theme we've been on for a while doing the oil printing and stuff. Um, I have in the past printed on glass with carbon. Um, a, and I'm gonna to try to show you that. Um, carbon on glass. I have to. I didn't have that pulled up, so I'm gonna to have to try to find it here. Um, I'll show you the image that I made on, on glass here. Let me grab both of that. Yeah, that's a good shot there. I got them here, so let me download these from my G drive. Um, so the idea here is, um, or, or the question is, is can we print, um, can we make pigment prints on glass? Can we do, I know I can do carbon, I've done that. Uh, the question was, can you do oil prints on glass? And of course you can. I mean, it wasn't really, is this technically possible? Of course it is. We know we can. Um, I want to show you my carbon on glass here. Let me share this with you. Uh, um, uh, I'll share both of them. Let me share my screen real quick. I'll show you the, uh, this is carbon on glass here. Um, this is an old, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm going to show you another one. I'm, I'm actually printing out on my Rionet right now. This is a carbon transfer on a piece of glass. So this is the image uh, a little closer up. Let me see if I can pull up. Uh, there it is, just against the, the light there. I just, that's how I photograph and just hold them up to my lights and photograph them. So it's a little bright there. It's a better representation on the other one. So that's carbon on glass. So our question was, can we do the same thing with oil? And yes, we can. And yesterday I printed and filmed, I filmed this, I'll show you this. This is really fun. I think I'm, I'm still experimenting, of course, I've only done this a couple of times, but I'm thinking I might lean toward doing this ghost dance work on glass, oil on glass. It's just absolutely amazing. And the effect you get is just tremendous. Um, this is the image I printed. I'm going to show it to you both ways. Um, that's the piece of glass. I'm going to turn it around so you can see it with the texture. It's still drying, right? It's still, it's still wet. Um, but this is the piece of glass. And if you could see this in person, let me flip this back around. If you could see, I'm going to get my hands all covered. See, I got just ink coming off of there. It's still very, uh, very wet ink. But you'll see this. Uh, I got some good shots on the camera with it. It's just, it's an amazing artifact. And the, the, when the light is right, 
and you have these uh, on glass like this, and you can you, you could show them either way, right? This is through the glass. Um, and boy, does it give it a depth. It is amazing. I was, I got, I got my, uh, my photo goosebump, my, my chills up yesterday when I started rolling this out. I just started, oh my God, this is amazing. Look better and better each time. And I got, uh, I got three more over there on the, or one more over there on the printer. And, and how well does that adhere to the glass? As you're rolling it, does it tend to wipe it off? No. No, it, it adheres very well. Um, what you want to do is I pounced right here and I had a couple of bubbles raised raise on it. They're drawing back down now, but I pounced on it a little bit and it, it, it disturbed the gelatin just a little bit. But you could do these whole prints just rolling them out. I mean, you could and do- how did you, how did you prepare the glass? Uh, let's, let's take a look. That's perfect. Um, and here, I'm printing one out here. This is a salt print of one I'm printing out. This is not waxed. This is a salt print that I'm making uh, one on right now. It's on the Ryonet. So if we get time, I'll, I'll follow through with that. Let's do that. Let's show you what I did here. Because this is really cool. I, uh, I really love this. Um, see if we can view. And, and it's really given me a, another way to look at possible ways to present work or make a body of work. And man, they're fragile and beautiful. So there's the question, right? Can we print can oil prints on glass? So here I am. <clears throat> I cut two pieces of seven by seven inch glass, just regular window pane glass. And the excess pieces I used here, these on the sides, you can see me putting them around the piece of glass. What I'm going to do is I'm going to level that off so my strips stay level because if my strips would, would tilt off the glass, you'll see here. And I do a couple of these. I'm going to show you different ways to do this, or at least the ways I've done, I, I, the way I did it here. Same thing, just like paper, except it's a little more fragile, right? They'll move around on you a little bit. And the second one, you'll see that I pour. I don't have that much of a problem. Same thing, my magnetic strips are not sticking to the metal or adhering to the metal through the glass. It's one point, uh, or it's 2.2 millimeter thick, two millimeters thick. So it's the, the magnetic strips are not adhering, but I'm just using the strips to guide the gelatin. You'll see here in just a second. So just take, I just took my time, lined them all up, same thing, just like I do with a regular piece of paper. Um, there's no wetting the glass, it's just cleaned. I did mark it, that, those are the alignment marks I'm using to put my strips on. Just like doing regular old oil or carbon, right? Regular old uh, pigment printing stuff. There's my double boiler with my 45 degree water, Celsius water in it, I wiped the bottom off. This is a six by six or 15 centimeter plate. So I'm gonna do 30 mils, 28 mils of, of gelatin here. <clears throat> and of course, I didn't show you this because you, you guys already know this, you need to have your surface level, right? And you'll see that it's level when I pour the, the oil or the gelatin on. Here I go, calling the gelatin oil again. <laughs> Forgive me if I do that, I get excited and I, all I wanna do is talk about the oil print when it's really the gelatin. So here we go, nice, warm, melted gelatin, <clears throat> pour it toward the top because it's going to kind of roll around. That's a nice balanced level area. Now here's where you have to be careful and you'll see the second one I do, I remedy this problem. Um, I can't really shove those, connect those up really hardcore to the edge because I'll move the strip away. But you have to work fast and it's, you know, it's 18 degrees in my basement here Celsius, it's 65 degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't have a lot of time if I want a good surface of uh, gelatin. So I have to move quick. Again, this is on a piece of just regular window pane glass. So I get those all connected up, look good, and leave it alone. That's it. I just let it sit for a few minutes here, and I call it good right there. That's all we need to do. No more. Come back in about there, five minutes. Yeah, go ahead. But there's no pigment in that gelatin? No, no pigment in the gelatin. It's just 8% hmm. uh, Photo Bloom 250, just like you saw in the first video. In fact, that's, that's the mix. I'm still, I got about 100 mils left of that. I just mixed it up, melted it, and I reheat it every time, melt it down. It's just 8%, mm -hmm. 80 grams to a liter, 40 grams to 500 mils of distilled water, and that's it. So no pigment in it. That's why you see through to the metal 
um, table there and uh, the gelatin set up now in about five minutes and I'm gonna cut it, cut just the gelatin away from the glass. And you can see it kind of uh, rippling up there. You can see that the gelatin is jellified or set up. Just cut it away with the opposite. I just use the opposite end of the razor blade. Same process here as I did on the first one. I pull my strips up very carefully, pull them away. It's actually a little bit cleaner than doing it on paper for some odd, weird reason. I guess because of the surface, you don't have any absorption. And boy, do they clear nicely. You're, you'll see this. Uh, you'll see this whole process. It, boy, do they clear so much faster than on paper, too. That's a, another really beautiful thing. So there it is. The gelatin set up quite well. I'll go put this in the dark room, move my little strips away here. Um, I'll go put this in the dark room, and you'll be able to uh, dry it down, and then we'll go ahead and sensitize it. Had a little gelatin on that piece of glass I was just wiping off. So there it is. Boom, boom, boom. Ready to go. So now I get this bright idea. I'm going to tape the, these little strips down and then drop my pour glass in the center of it, put my bottom strip up, and this way I'll have a little uh, cleaner plate. And this one is extremely clean. This, and this worked out really well. So not that I, I don't like to use tape because boy, you can blow through it really easily, but this, this was all experimental. So I wanted to try this. I even tape my little, uh, put my, I tape a couple of these strips down to hold them in place. But you can see the glass strips on the side and the top, just keep, keep it so my strips are level. That's, that's all it is. You'd, you'd be popping off the edge if they weren't. I'm just gonna hold that one in place, just a little easier. Because all this work, you want to make sure you get this stuff right. Well, again, we kind of go through this again. Same thing. Tape them down. They just need to kind of hold in place. Just uh, glass is slippery, and I just didn't want them moving around so much. And you get this down after a while, pouring paper, a lot of paper. I've been doing, God, I don't know. I've been doing three or four prints a day for a while now. Thank you, coronavirus. We get a lot of practice now. I, I get to make time for stuff that I never get to time for regard, in any other way. Not, not that we want the coronavirus, but it has uh, given me some time for sure. So I let that bottom strip. I didn't tape that. There's 30 mils of warm gelatin again out of my little warm cup. Wipe the bottom off so I don't drip, uh, drip water on the glass. Um, I think I need to wipe my comb off here. That's what I'm doing. I'm just wiping my, my uh, mover comb. Just making sure that water's off that comb as much as possible. And here we go again, right in the center of the plate or top center, if you will, just depends. Um, just so it's nice and level, and if it, the more equal it goes out, the better distribution you're going to have. That's a perfectly level plate there. So have a little more liberty now to connect these corners up. Push them all the way up into the corners and the sides if you can. And since I'm going right to the edge and my negatives are 6 by 6 or 15 square centimeter, um, I want to make sure I get as much of that on there as I can. So if I have a little peel away or break off or whatever, I usually don't. But if I do, it just ensures that I, um, I'm good to go. So there we go. Another nice plate. I'll stop right there. It's cool. That gelatin's going to set up quickly. And that's it. Five minutes later, again, the opposite edge of the blade. Cut around the strips. In fact, it was probably three or four minutes, or three minutes, it, all it took, because it's so cool down here in my studio, my work area. That gelatin set up quick. Just the same thing again. Peel the tape away this time, though. And you'll see how clean this plate is. You'll see, uh, although the other plate was fine, too. Uh, the other plate was the one I did the, the print on here that we have. Just take your time. You don't want to destroy your gelatin or pull any big pieces away, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and the last one. And I like to <clears throat> I like to wipe my strips off 
before I lay them down onto the metal plate again. Take this bottom bar off <clears throat> and off we go. I was just looking at the plate. There you go. Really clean, really nice. Looks wonderful. So now you have those, they're dried. <clears throat> Next day I come in <clears throat> and just, <clears throat> I'm gonna speed this up just a little bit. I'm just putting those in place to kind of hold it as I brush. Uh, this was kind of a learning lesson here. Um, this goes on a little bit different than on paper. You'll see here, 10% potassium dichromate. And forgive me, I'm not wearing gloves, I know. <clears throat> and somebody will call me out on that. <clears throat> but I don't, uh, I've done this enough that I, I want you guys to wear gloves. If you haven't worked with dichromate a lot, don't, don't work with it without gloves. But I don't get any, anything anywhere. I just, uh, I'm really careful. There's uh, three and a half mils of 10% dichromate and then three and a half mils of acetone. That'll cover 36 square inches, which is six by six inches. <clears throat> I see something on the plate that I just kind of brushed off. So three and a half mils of acetone gives us our spirit solution. Now here's one little trick. I like to let that fizz out and settle down until it's clear again. And there it is, you can see it, it's, it's clearing up there. I'll, I'll swish it around a little bit here. But um, this was a learning lesson. I'm getting my brush wet in my bucket of water so it doesn't absorb the, um, the um, dichromate. I pour it all out in the center and just start working it around. Now the second one I do here, you'll see, I put a piece of white paper underneath of it so you can see what you're doing. <clears throat> but just gently move it around. I'm not using any pressure. I'm just getting it soaked into the gelatin. <clears throat> work it, work it, and uh, you'll you'll get uh, you get your uh, you get your stuff laid down there nicely. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter if you go over the edges, no problem. Unpin it, and you you don't really hang these plates. I guess you could if you had a strong enough uh, hanger. But here's the second one on white. You'll see this a little bit better. I sped it up because you've already seen one. Three and a half mils, three and a half mils, over and over again. I move fast in this one, very fast. Right in the center, boom, boom, boom. Now I can tell what the surface is looking like a little more, rather than having it just on the cardboard. I can see where my thick areas are and where my lines are or not. So I work this a little bit. This is the one that I'm printing out right now as we speak. It's over on the Ryonet. It's already printed out, but um, so this is this is a really nice one. I always need one to get my my groove on and then do one for real. But this one turned out nice. So I'm going to stop right in here. I see a couple of heavy spots, so I'm just going to hit that. I'm going to do one more down, and I'm going to stop. There it is. Nice clear plate. Nice clean. Let it go. Let it go, Quinn. Oh, I can't resist. I gotta, I gotta hit it one more time. <laughs> Just to make sure. We don't want any big streaks on it. Be careful about where it's cool down here, but just be careful about working this too long. There it is. Boom, boom, boom. It's a little foggy because as it dries, it'll evaporate out and clear. They're perfectly clear. So here's after that was an 11 minute print on that one. I'll show you the piece of glass here. You can't see it against the gray coin. There it is. There's my printed out tree shot, the one I just showed you at the beginning of this video. And then for whatever reason, I don't like to only print one. I like, here's another, here's another of my ghost dance on. This happens to be on burrito paper. So really glossy burrito paper. That turned out very nice as well too. Temperature of the water is about 21 Celsius or 70 degrees. I'm gonna wash the dichromate. Literally only took about 20 minutes to wash the dichromate out of the off of the glass. The glass isn't absorbing any dichromate, it's just the gelatin. So you don't have it's not paper, right? So you don't have any of that in there. So it went very fast. I did about 10 grams, five grams of uh, EDTA in a liter of water. I'm holding the camera and trying to shoot uh, work my hand as well, too. So there we go. Uh, 20, 21 degrees. Perfect. Don't get it too warm. That's about as warm as you want to go. 
<clears throat> so I'm going to drop the glass in first. There goes the glass. And man, the water turned yellow it's just straight away. I've never seen dichromate come off so fast. And here, I got to put the rocks on the corner of this one. I'm like a one armed paper hanger. Trying to do hold the camera and do the. I didn't mount it up because I knew I wouldn't be in here very long. So in this bath, I added about a 0.5%, a half a percent solution of, uh, look at that water, how yellow it is, um, about a half a percent of uh, EDTA. EDTA clears that. So there it is, fresh out of the bath. It's all swollen up, kind of wiped it off. You see that? It's so beautiful to see the, the raised gelatin, uh, the swollen gelatin on the glass. It's really cool looking. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how I want to do this here, but look at that swell on it. Just, just two pass, just one pass on it. That's, that's why I like to use the strength that I use. You can, you can see the image straight away. And I'm just going to work this for a little while. I'll go in and do some brush work in the sky. Um, but boy, I recommend trying some of this on glass. I'll show you some shots here. It is just phenomenal looking. I, I go ahead and tape this down because the glass is just moving too much on me. So I'm just going to tape the corners down. I already kind of planned to do that anyway, or three pieces anyway. <laughs> I'm going to grab another piece of tape. So now it's a good and solid, and I can, uh, I can start working that pretty good. Um, I work a little bit of ink into those trees in the background. And it's a little deceiving because you got that two mils of glass you're looking through. It's very three-dimensional. So it's, it's not a flat two-dimensional image. So it's, it's, it took me a minute. And you'll see, I'll show you the shot of what I'm talking about. This is straight brown. I do add a little bit of black at the end, just mixed in with the brown. Um, this is a little more, con a little more darker looking than the, the print is actually is. Um, I don't know, just the color balance, I guess. But the texture on the trees and the foreground, just absolutely stunning. I'm totally sold on this. So you see the tree in the middle? I'm not, the ink is not taking on that. So I'm going to pounce a little ink in there. The foreground, the big tree, the keep out tree is nice. The top of the trees are coming in. I'm going to remove a little ink here with this brush. I can actually see it taking away because I, I, I'm going to roll these out again. So I'm taking a little bit of ink away from the whole plate. Now I'm going to go back in and I'm going to roll this tree out on this side. As I go up, I, I'm trying to concentrate on those trees in the back there. And I don't want to, if I blow the foreground out, I just roll my little yellow roller and it removes some of the ink. And I'll get my brush out here in a second and you'll see what I do. <clears throat> Work it, work it, work it. I do these quite fast because I know we're, we're on video and we're trying to see what's happening. So I'm gonna get my, uh, I'm gonna lay it, see that ink going down, see the trunk of the trees now coming in, the stem of the tree, but there's that one corner where the light's really hitting it. I wanna, I wanna lay more ink in there. So <clears throat> this is what I'll do here. I'll grab my brush. <clears throat> And I'll go for, there you go. Look at that. That is mind boggling. Absolutely mind boggling. The texture on that stuff is crazy. Another great thing I thought about too, is, is maybe I'll show this, I'll do a video on this. I'm gonna do one of these. I'm gonna roll it out like this. Let it, let the gelatin dry. And the ink is still wet on this. I'm gonna put a piece of paper on it and roll it out and see if I can do a transfer do a transfer from the wet ink is when the gelatin's dry. These, I hear really good things about um, transfers, uh, oil print transfers. I wanna try some. I'm just taking a little excess ink off of the tops and the bottom so you still see the detail down there. Cause that is really hardened gelatin. So it's taking on a lot of ink, which is fine. See the tree trunk come back in at the base there? Really simple. Once you start doing this, you can really work up how you wanna make the print happen. So I'm gonna get the, the wedge step wedge out. I'm gonna take um, whatever color I had on there. I'm gonna add a little brown here. And watch the tree. 
going to do it gently, do it gently. Add a little more ink. Add it gently. See that? See that? I'm 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 making that tree appear. 19th century Photoshop, right? <laughs> Make that appear. While at the same time, I'm adding a little bit of ink to the sky too, and I'll take that away here in just a second. A little bit more detail there. I'm actually picking up ink down here in the heavy spots and transferring a little bit over to the, there we go. This will make a little more sense when I show it to you again now, now that you see, see how I made it. And you can work these as long as you want. Again, you could stop right there, let that dry down, swell it the next day, roll it over with some black, work it again with some more brown, more detail, uh, take stuff out, add stuff in, whatever you want to do. It's really amazing what you can do with that. I'm just taking some ink off the brush there. I'm just going to hit the sky real quick, taking the ink off, hit the clear space again. That'll remove the ink really fast. So that's just clear glass now. And it is. It's really clear. As I can even look at this print here. One quick rollover. I have a little bit of black um, put in this now. So you can see that. Look at that. See that? It's where a little bit of a gelatin rolled up on me right there. Take my brush out, hit that back down real gently. I don't want to pull it off. It dried down fine. It's drying down fine. Very cool. I love it. And if you could hold this plate in your hand, you'd be amazed. The color's not quite right on the screen there. I got more red in there. Clean that out just a little bit. And I'm going to pull this off now. I'm going to take the camera out, I think, here and show it to you. So I usually stop right there. I don't want to work them too hard. There we go. I don't have any fingernails. <clears throat> I really love these through the glass. They're just really amazing looking. So there's the wet, if you will. I mean, the, the, or actually the swollen gelatin image. I just snapped it. Uh, on, that's a little more accurate color there. So there it is. Then if I come over here and I take it up again, you'll be able to see a little better color rendering. See that red, more red color? That's what I'm after, is that I don't want to drop this. That more red color. You can still, it's swollen just still a little bit down there on the tree trunk. Then if we look at it the other way, through the glass, it kind of renders out that way. A lot more detail. So there we are. That is oil on glass and it can be done. It's lovely. Um, I recommend you trying it. It's, uh, it's phenomenal. Um, Will this instruction video be available in the password section of the website to refer to later, another three weeks of lockdown here? <laughs> Actually, um, I was gonna live stream it. Um, yes, yes, Kareem, I, I have that video. Um, I will put the part three up online. I haven't done that. I got so consumed with making these oil prints that I, I kind of lost. Uh, hardener for the gelatin. If you want, Peter, you can add some alum to it. That will harden up the gelatin. Normally you won't have a problem if you use Photo 250 Bloom. It's usually stiff enough to hold up, but sometimes I pounce them hard. A little bit of alum, alum will not hurt. 1%, um, you know, 
10 grams a liter, something like that, won't hurt it at all. Um, no, John, uh, you, uh, that wouldn't, well, you know what? I don't know. That's a great question. That could be uh, if you wanted to, the problem would be more with how hard you're pouncing if you're going to use a brush um, and, and how, how dry your roller, how sticky the ink will be. That's more of a wet gelatin problem. Would it help? Would the albumin help the gel? Probably would help, actually. I, I can run, I'll run some tests on that and see. That might help, actually. If you wanted to go to that extra measure, if you're really, uh, if you're really interested in, in trying that um, and go that extra measure, it might help. Let's walk over to the uh, printer and pull that, uh, pull that. Um. Oh, to answer uh, Phil's question, this is gonna be available um, online. So no problem on getting to it. Let's see, I'm gonna set you down over here on the books. I think you'll hold there. So which one is which? I, I printed three of them out. There's the uh, that salt print one that I told you about. Wow. I could probably use a little more time on her. There's a little more time maybe. Let's see on the other side here. I did 12 minutes on this. It may need about 15. I might do three more minutes on her. Oh, there's a little bit of detail in the white down there. I'm going to do two more minutes on her. Oh, yeah, here's our here's our other uh, glass piece. I did the, I think this is good. I'm going to pop this one out. This is our other glass piece. Take our negative off. Thank God it didn't stick. <laughs> I always worry about that. Wow, I don't have anything on there. Really, I don't have anything on there at all. There's no faint image at all. I'm wondering, I let this glass sit overnight. I'm wondering if that's, uh, that's an issue there. We'll have to check that out. And then here's my last one. Oh yeah, this is on Strathmore paper, wrinkly Strathmore. We'll go throw these in the wash and see. Um, I don't see anything on this piece of glass. That, that may have something to do. I'm gonna throw it back in and see if I can get anything here, guys. This is what's fun about uh, experimenting with this stuff, right? You get to... Uh, you get to find out what works and what doesn't. With glass, I can do this quite easily. Hey, Quinn, when did you put the dichromate on that? Yesterday, when I did these, that, that ah. other print. So oh. uh, typically I have two days. So I'm wondering if it's something with the glass that, um, that, that really uh, speeds the, the, uh, the time you have. I know they work, because I have one over there that I, I did immediately after, I, after it was dry. I uh, put it in, uh, put put the print on and printed it out, no problem. So let's do this. Let's take this one in. I'm going to give these guys, I'm going to give this three more minutes. Three minutes on the Ryonet. Here we go. So let's go ahead and throw this in the wash. Yeah, it may be, you know, it may be um, something to do with, uh, completely dark in here. It may be something to do with the glass and how the glass um, reads. Maybe that is, maybe that is UV, UV filter in, in glass. The glass? Yes. Yeah, I'm thinking, because nothing else changed. So I was expecting um, something to show on that, you know? So nothing else changed. Let's get some warm water here, or cool water. Yeah, pay attention to your water temperature, guys. And here's that first batch of oil. I have more than 100 mils. I have, geez, I have 250 mils of oil still, or gelatin still left for oil prints on that. Goes a long way. 
So I'm going to lay this print down. This again, this is Strathmore. This is a paper that I have never used for this process. Does it work? I don't know. I like to run tests and find out. Let's see what it does here. There we go. Oh, we could go just a tad bit warmer. And this is how I like to, I like to, uh, I like to add a little hot water in there. Not right directly on, it's cool water in here just to get it up to temperature, that feels better. There we go. 21 degrees Celsius, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, looks good. So this is how, this is what I do, is that is, boy that dichromate's really coming off of there too. This is what I do, I take my EDTA and I put about, you know, a teaspoon for a liter, a heavy teaspoon, maybe five grams, just like that. Throw it in there, nothing measured out, just put it in my bucket, turn my warm water on, Again, about the same temperature as your, about 21 degrees, somewhere in there. EDTA gets really slippery and slick. Where's my spoon at? <clears throat> I lost, oh, there it is. Make sure you just stir this up. Put, put a little more cool water in that one. There's a liter, and what I like to do Perfect. What I like to do is I like to actually dump that first um, brush of water out. Wow, that is thin paper. That's what it's looking like. It's clearing really fast there. Put some nice water in there again. And now, wow. There we go. That's our EDTA mix. See how we fare with that. And get that nice and flat. Dilute it down just a bit. Wow, yeah, it's really clearing. So I've never ran this paper before. I don't know what's gonna happen. Um, but it's fun to see, watch and see. It's clearing fast, I know that. That EDTA makes everything really slippery, so heads up if you're using that. You'll drop your beakers, glass beakers, and everything else. There we go. That's clearing really nicely, super fast. I'll show you a peek of it. My rocks, just to hold the paper down. Blow it away. Wow, we have swelling already on the skull. We can, it's already swelling up, which is a good sign. We want that back down in the EDTA. We'll just walk away from this for a few minutes and come back. Nice temperature of water, nice and cool. Beautiful, beautiful. Let me rinse my hands off. Just like that, guys. Maybe we'll even roll this print out. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Let me draw my hands off. <clears throat> so we're going to set the timer for 15 minutes and come back in here. That's it. Real time uh, processing here. Uh, let's see if we get anything on that other. Uh, See if we get any action over here because we're finished printing out here. Boop, boop, boop. That is a super dense negative, though. This is a salt print negative, so yeah. I think I can live with that one. Wow, that's crazy. That's on ADOX burrito paper. Let's see if we get anything. I think I don't have any sensitivity on this one, guys. Nope. 
I have zero sensibility, as they say. <laughs> Nothing. And that was my good, good sheet of, uh, so maybe that was my good sheet of uh, glass, uh, gelatinized and dichromated glass. So maybe the lesson here is, is with glass, you might want to sensitize and immediately go uh, for processing, uh, do, uh, printing out and clearing. Once you have the matrix, you're good, right? I mean, that's obvious. So I'm gonna clear, I'm gonna melt the gelatin right off of this uh, glass. That is the lesson learned there. And I'll get this one in here as well too. Yeah, there is absolutely nothing on that. Not even the faintest of an image. Nothing. Lesson learned. All right. I'm not heartbroken. I'm not, uh, I'm not discouraged at all. I'm glad that I know that. I'm glad that I understand what... Uh, and I could actually verify that, right? The scientific method. method. Uh, do it again and see if the same thing happens. Here we go with this one. I'm going to get it in the water. Try it down real quick. Boy, that ADOX is curly and ratty paper. I was surprised that this even worked. This is ADOX burrito paper. Normally used for chlorine chloride. I'm going to set that to the side. And, whoop, and I'm going to get, uh, I use my big pan for this. Let's get some really hot water. And wash that, melt that gelatin off of that. He's over here in the corner. So I can run my water super, super hot here. So I'm going to reuse that piece of glass. Why not? Right? Boy, that gelatin or that uh, dichromate comes out of that gelatin quick with, what am I running? About 100 or about 55 Celsius, about 130 Fahrenheit. Yeah. Change colors quite a bit, and you can see the, the yellow water there. But not only do I want to take the dichromate, I want to take the gelatin completely off of that. I guess I could use a razor blade too, but I'll just melt it off. Woo! Actually, that is 60 degrees. That's 140 degrees Fahrenheit water. I got my water heater set up quite high because I do this kind of stuff. Almost clear. You'd be melting your image away big time if you tried that hot of water, I think. A lot of her people go nuts with temperature wise, so. I can see the gelatins come melting off now because I see the water is getting um, kind of bubbly. Yeah. I'll let that sit. All right, let's move, uh, let's go back over to our other prints here. Here's where you have to remember to get the cold water back through the lines. So there's a lot of yellow clearing on that. Clearing on that image there. We're starting to raise a little bit on that already too. Now this is the EDPA. We're almost uh, into a focus out. See where we're at. 
This is how I do it, multitasking. Wow, I think this might be a cool, cool print here. Wow, definitely raised. Can you see that? That's the rabbit skull on the oak ball there. Clearing, clearing, clearing. That's good. So now I don't have any. I just, the EDTA is washed out. I'm just going to set this in there for another few minutes. Let it completely clear. You don't want to walk away from these um, when you're doing this because if you leave a uh, printing too long, you will overswell it for sure. I'm going to do some EDTA in this now. Help clear it. You can see the drastic difference when you're clearing these um, from almost clear to just starting to clear. This will really pull it out. EDTA, mix it up. Beautiful. Well, that stuff just starts pulling that dichromate out so fast. I can literally see it going for it. The paper is so wrinkly, that burrito, Adox burrito, that, uh, that there are areas that are dipped down that, that are retaining more dichromate as it swells than others, but I wanted to try these papers. I wanted to see what uh, happens with them and see if I can get any images out of them. Because at this point in time, yeah, it's looking real good. That skull is really raised up there on that one. So, all right, let's go out. We'll do a little Q&A maybe while these are clearing the rest of the way on this one. Sucks about the glass, but you know what? Completely cleared now. I probably have to. I wonder, I wonder if I just re-dichromated that gelatin like that dry. What do you think? Maybe I'll try that. Although I do have the streaks, I think I'll just pour it again. But anyway, let's go back and we'll do a little Q and A. You guys have any questions? Or... I'm gonna put this on so I remember, because if I don't, I'll forget about that I have prints in here. Back to the white world. This is that, uh, that ADOX one that I'm talking about. That's a salt print of it. So I thought it might be interesting to do, uh, do an oil print with so much white and see the relief and all that. Um, let's see. <laughs> yes, I do brain fart all the time, actually. Um, but you know what? At the same time, um, I do take notes. I have my little book here that I write in, my little green book, and uh, I make notes. And, and today I'll make a note that I sensitized that piece of glass yesterday. And uh, today I went to print out and zero. Uh, and that, that first one, that was 10, that was a total of 13 minutes. That's way, I mean, every negative I have would print. I mean, that, that's just no way. And I didn't have a, the faintest of image on that glass. So there must be some correlation with, uh, with the, the dichromate uh, 
losing its sensitivity faster on glass. Why? I have no idea. Maybe somebody knows. I don't know. But um, definitely something happened. And I'll repeat that just to make sure that that's valid. Um, let's see. Uh, surprised to, when he sees the comments. What, what is it? You put the negative under the glass. It seems like you remove the negative first. No, it, it wouldn't matter. I mean, no, I didn't. It, the the the, uh, the the sensitized glass, the the oil, the gelatinized glass sensitized went down first. The negative went on top, right? And it wouldn't matter anyway. It wouldn't matter, guys. The, it, it, it's glass, so. Even if it were reversed, what would happen? It would still show an image of some kind. It's not like uh, paper blocking it, right? It, it doesn't have it doesn't have that same uh, methodology. So glass, it would it would have some image on it. Even if I had them reversed, um, it would have some image on it. That first nine minutes, any or ten minutes, that first exposure was ten minutes. The one that did uh, did the uh, skull shot in there that's washing now. Is that what you guys are talking about? Somebody chime in here. Is that what you're talking about? You think I had the images reversed and it made some, it made a difference? Like if you put yeah. the glass over and you, you printed through the glass, you'd still have an image on your paper regardless, right? It may be fuzzy or soft, but you still have an image. Quinn. Yes. Um, you didn't have the negative between the glass on the contact printer and your glass plate. So it went, the light went through the negative, through the, um, plate, the uh, print holder onto the glass plate and then the negative afterwards. It wouldn't it matter. Wouldn't Why? It, it wouldn't matter because it's all glass, right? It wouldn't matter. It, if you, how do I put this? If the you, light's hitting the dichromate before it hits the negative. Your negative is between the, the gelatin plate and the back of the con your contact printer. Right, I know what you're saying, right. Let's see. Is that what it was? Maybe, maybe I did, maybe I did totally screw that one. Not for the first 10 minutes though. Let's, I'll, I'll look at that video. Cause I laid the sensitized glass, the oil, gelatinized glass on the, on the contact printer frame, then the negative, then the negative. Emulsion to emulsion. So the first 10 minutes that went through, Sorry, that's opposite, isn't it? Yeah, maybe you're right. I'll have to, I'll check that out and see. Maybe you're right. That could be. Damn, I wish I had another piece of glass now. So I do, yeah, maybe, maybe I did totally brain fart on that one, didn't I? Because this one. And if you do, if you do two more, like you described with the scientific method and, and let yeah. one the first night and then let it sit overnight and do it again. And they both give you an image and you know it was reversed. Yeah, exactly. I can look at the video too. Um, what, what kind of blows my mind. Yeah, I get, I did. I did. Re I'm thinking now I did reverse them. Yeah, I think I did. I'll look at the video anyway. So if I screwed the pooch on that one, I screwed the pooch, I guess. I don't know. It, it, but yeah, I can, I can definitely check it. <clears throat> so you're right. The, what you need to do is lay your medium down first, right? So in this case, it would be the gelatinized glass uh, plate, uh, dichromated. Then your negative emulsion to emulsion on top of that. <clears throat> right? So this paper laid down on a contact printer with a negative emulsion side down in the contact printer it laying put into light is going to block some light, right, the highlights, and let other light through. And that's the 
that's that that's where you get it. And I'm wondering now if, and I can't remember what I did this morning when I did that. Maybe I was distracted. Did I lay the negative down first? Or did I lay the material down first? Either way, I'll, I'll figure it out. If I did, screw it, I, I did. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good lesson either way. Just remember, whatever I did here, I'll look back at it. But whatever, maybe the second time, for the second three minutes, I had, I, I had the dichromated plate. Uh, yeah, I just put the negative on top of it. You're right, uh, uh, reverse-wise. But the first 10 minutes, um, I'll, I'll look at the negative and see. If I did that, you're right. I wouldn't have any image. All the all the dichromate would be hardened. Um, you're right about that. And I'll look at that. So yeah, it is a good lesson. So yeah, working with glass, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? But obviously, I laid this one down right, whatever, whatever it was um, on the first one. So normally, I'd get that right. But maybe we're uh, I'm going to try to press that down real quick and see what happens. Wow. Yeah. Man, I like those things reversed. I love them reversed like that. Look at that thing. Let's see if I can blow this up. Look at that. Oh, it doesn't show. I'm trying to, I, the, the ink was still wet and I was trying to, trying to put something against there. No. Oh. Well, the ink is dry enough not to do very little, trans only on the thick part of the bottom. So what you can do when your ink is still wet, you could lay that against a piece of paper like that and press it down and transfer the ink onto the, do a, do a reverse or a transfer onto the paper. That's what I'm gonna try next. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. So, um, any anybody got anything they want to chat about or talk about? We're open. We're game. The floor is open, as it were. Nothing, huh? I can't believe that. I'd have a lot of questions. Like, why don't you wax your salt prints, Quinn? <laughs> no, not that question. I'm going to break my glass plate here if I'm not careful. Hey, Quinn, John here. Uh, yes. So uh, I've been doing a little bit of research into the whole gelatin stuff and the uh, dichromate and the sensitivity thereof. Right. And I have your IONET, and you said that uh, it peaks around, what, 350, right? Yeah, somewhere in there, yeah. Yeah, So do you know what the UV range is on your IONET? With the full uh, UV range, I, I think I think it's between 300 and 450, somewhere in there. Okay. It's, it's a screen printing unit, so it's heavy in the UVA and B, uh, mostly A. Uh, they've tried to mimic the pure north actinic light from the sky, okay. right? So 5800 Kelvin and and uh, 5700 Kelvin and uh, UVA, strong UVA, and I think mine. They said mine would average around 350, 375 nanometers, which is, you know, black light bulbs are like 450 or something, you know, LED right. or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So oh, yeah, uh, I, I went and added a, uh, I put a link in here that I found. Uh, cool. I, I was doing some my uh, deep research on gelatin and sensitized gelatin and stuff. If you scroll down to section four, it gives you a little bit more, but I mean, the whole thing is pretty damn, uh, informative for others that may not get into the weeds like I do about this stuff. Nice. So, um, but uh, I thought it was some pretty cool stuff and talks about gelatin uh, photosensitized with dich dichromate and all that. Um, so in a, in a nutshell, what does it say? What, what's, what's the takeaway? Uh, 365 is the max sensitivity for dichromate. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, but I was, what, what I guess really my question was, how do you, fully develop those highlights, half tones, mid tones and everything, you know, because if you, have, if you have like one specific light sensitivity, it may only get certain areas of the image you may not get those half tones, right? So what's the spread and how far across the board do you have to be to get the full and complete picture? You know, yeah. how accurate you have to be like, uh, also your glass, the light transmission of, of the glass itself, 
I, I was looking at uh, getting some like custom borosilicate glass yep. plates made. Yeah. Uh, and it's got about 90% light transmission rate at those yep. ranges, like from 320 to 460, I believe. Yeah. So I don't know. That, that's just kind of where I was. My my head was going toward how to how to get the most right. They're great range of tonality in your in your print for your for, right. for your oils across the board. So that that that's really what, what that was all about. That is great. Thanks for sharing that. That is a very good point. And I'll tell you this. I know for a fact that if you go to uh, I posted this link a while ago. Um, I have the. Uh, the uh, 1.3 mil glass from John, or what's his name, uh, Lane, Jason Lane, Jason Lane. He does dry plate um, plates for people. And I got a hundred sheets of the whole plate, really thin glass. Even that I noticed, and uh, a big difference, or, or a substantial difference in exposure. And I got looking into it. And the transmission of uh, light, and one of the reasons I've studied this is because on our property, what I want to build is a north lit studio. Um, so I need a certain amount of trans, uh, 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 UV light coming through that glass. Most glass, 90% of glass out there today, like your window glass, is going to prevent UV light. Just like John says, it's going to retard it. And you can get, um, I posted a link back a bit ago. I'd have to look for it, uh, and I'll post it again if I can. Uh, I'll find it and post it. If I can remember, <clears throat> there's a company that you can get this very, th you can go down to one mil thickness of glass and lime, what's it called? Lime uh, soda glass, uh, soda glass uh, will do over 90% UV transmission. So in a perfect world, if you used ammonium dichromate instead of potassium dichromate in, in this process, and you used one mil uh, soda glass, um, you're going to have in a, a, a 350 nanometer, 300 nanometer, 400 nanometer, whatever you want to do, or natural UV light, you're going to have maximum um, UV light hitting that, that dichromate. And the idea behind that is, is, again, when the highlights block the transmission of light, that gelatin stays, stays soft. When it goes through, that gelatin hardens. Um, and so at the end of the day, you have the hard and flattened gelatin taking the ink uh, on and the raised swells gelatin where it didn't harden repelling the ink. So the whites and the blacks, if you will. Um, so uh, uh, as far as exposure goes, I've just played with my negatives and I know my outdoor negatives and my still lifes are generally, be generally between 10 and 12 minutes on the Ryonet. Um, for showing highlight, showing detail in the highlights. That's what you go for when you're doing these oil prints. That's going to get you in the ballpark. Now, you can fine tune that and adjust that. That's our paper there. Let me go. Let's go grab that. You can adjust that and fine tune that as you go. And the, the, definitely, John, you're right. The glass you use, the dichromate you use, the, uh, the type of light that you use is all going to make a big, big difference. So that's a great point. Um, that's pretty clear. Let's see how swollen this one is. That's our EDTA. Um, I think somebody asked, could you go over what the purpose of that other super slippery sli Yes, EDTA. Phil, this is a clearing agent, EDTA. And the, the actual name of it's so long. It's an acid. It pulls. It, uh, chrome is attracted to it. Oh yeah, that's that's swelling nice. It's got a nice swell on it. Chrome is attracted to chromium, and uh, it pulls the chromium out of the gelatin. And boy, does it ever! That was a big load of load right there. But man, this uh, this Adox paper really, or the gelatin on it, really took up the the uh, solution. And it, it is slippery. It's the the EDTA is very, um, very slippery. So let's check our other one here and see how we're doing. We're almost completely clear. We could probably roll that one out. We can. Let's go over and roll this one out just for fun. This is the Strathmore paper here. That looks really good. 
Uh, I don't know if I can show any of the rays down the skull there. I don't want to drip on the laptop, so you'll we'll see it out here. Let's go roll this one out. That was it. That cleared nicely. That was good. So now we have this uh, cleared enough for me anyway. I, I don't mind. Uh, some of this is not just not going to have a unless you're on the glass. Yeah, I'll be interested to see what this one does. Let's go out and take a look at it. And that's just in water there, that's fine. Let's go over to the rolling table and see what we can do here, just for fun. So, uh, 10 minute exposure on this, <clears throat> rolled it out. Here, I mean, uh, cleared it out. Let's see if I can get you up here without having an absolute catastrophe here. There we go. Maybe, we'll see. Point, point, point. I'll turn that one on, turn this one on. So my roller is coming to the end of its life. So I'm hoping we'll get one more print out of it here. Since this is just kind of a test print anyway. You guys can see that. Yeah, good. Awesome. I'm just going to dab this water off the surface of this. Again, this is Strathmore, the Series 500. This is normally what I make salt prints on. Um, cold pressed, I believe. Get the water off the surface of that. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And let's see. Let's see what the uh, ink gods tell us here. My my roller's coming to the end of its life. I don't mind trying testing it on this at all. <clears throat> I'm going to clean it off here just real quick. I made a lot of prints with this thing, so forgive me. Put a little ink out here. I'm going to get a little ink on our uh, on our table, our glass here. This is the uh, 1903 dark brown that I'm going to use, which I always use. I add a little black in it sometimes, but sometimes these are buggers to get open to. There we go. That's what it looks like inside, if you can see it. Probably can't. Pull my uh, paper, my plastic back, and I grab a little bit of uh, grab a little bit of plastic in my. Uh, how much am I going to use for this print? About that much. Just a gob about that size. Put it on my glass over here. I'll take my uh, my roller. Let me close this back up. You do not want your inks drying out. And you want to stay mess free as possible, which is those two tasks are difficult to do sometimes. They're not totally compatible. This is a brayer, just a roller that I'm going to roll this ink out with. So forgive me if it's uh, jiggling the camera here a little bit. This is just to flatten it out and get an even coating on your roller. That's all this is. Let's see where we go with that. Yeah, this brush might be, this roller might be on its last leg. Let's see. So here we go. You see that quite well, I think. A little drop of water there. Got quite a bit of black in there. Really light and gentle. Don't put any pressure on it. <clears throat> if 
You'll recognize this one because it's the image on the cover of my book. I think you will anyway. So I want to lay it down a little bit heavy in the beginning and then I'll come back and kind of roll it away. Again, the Strathmore paper is brand new. I don't know what it's going to do, so bear with me through it. Boy, it's really doing a job on that gall nut or that oak gall, whatever you want to call it. So like, what, 30 seconds in? Um, I'll pull this up just a second. I'm going to start rolling some of this off of here. I love it. So like 30 seconds in, look how thin that paper is, man. I mean, that has, you can see my fingers through that stuff. Yeah. See that? So we're just starting. So bear with me here. If you want to hang out, go through the one, just a tiny bit more ink, throw a little bit of that off. And what's beautiful about this, I should tape that down, but what's beautiful about this, I can actually see my little, highlight of the, on the skull the, in the eye section of it even shining through. That's really nice. Wow, this paper is impressing me. It's impressive here. I might have to tape this down. Let me, let me just quickly put four corners of tape on this just so we don't have a peeling away accident. I always write down here what it, what the paper is, right? It says Strathmore right there, so I know. Beautiful details coming in now. Really nice. Really beautiful contrast coming. Very painterly. Exactly the kind of stuff that I want to achieve with this uh, process. Typically, I would stop right here. Um, I'm going to try to roll some of that away. Typically, I would stop right here and let it dry and then swell it again tomorrow and roll some black on it and just kind of finish it off. I just got a line in there from the edge of my roller. Don't worry about those things. I'll roll away. And I have a have a hair right there too, but we're going to let that dry. I'll pick that off after. Really gorgeous detail in the back of the skull here. I'll show you this here. One more and I'll stop. If you're after this painterly pictorialist look and feel, um, I doubt there's a process, printing process that's any more uh, beautiful and really, I mean, I, I love doing it obviously, but Let's take you over here. We'll put you on the big light here. Turn you around. I have two lights that I use. Let me cut this one off. So this is this is typically where I would stop if it's something serious I wanted to work with and come back the next day and roll through some black. Really beautiful. I mean, that really doesn't do it justice if you, I mean, you can see it. Um, as it dries down, you'd be able to um, see a little more of it. I have a little tiny hair right here in it, but I'm, I'm not gonna disturb the gelatin over that. Um, one roll on it, I'll finish this tomorrow maybe. One roll on it with some black and it'd just be beautiful. So. To, as a comparison from a straight photograph um, to an oil print, the difference, you know, that kind of thing. Um, nothing wrong with straight photographs, but there's a beauty about these, that, that painterly quality about them. So Strathmore paper, there it is, series 500.
There's a proof in the pudding. I didn't know I was going to do that, but why not? We had some time, so we rolled it out. Uh, Thyla says, um, oh, let's see. And have you used this EDTA? Yes, I use it for the glass as well. Uh-huh. Any anything, paper or glass, anything you want to pull dichromates out of, Phil, the EDTA will assist you in speeding that up to, to grab that chromium, chromate and pull it out or chrome. Um, and it and it helps, it binds with it and washes it away, kind of like a fix in silver, right? Um, yes, paper, glass, whatever, uh, just to clear the dichromate. You don't want that yellow on there. Um, Kyle says, you mentioned Jason Lane's dry plates. Would it be the difference between collodion negatives and dry plate negatives? I'm also asking the ISO go up to 25. Yes, exactly. Um, that's a good question. Jason Lane is, uh, I don't know him. Uh, I've spoken with him, you know, via, you know, doing business, getting uh, some plates. I got, like I said, I got a box of 100 of those whole plate, very thin glass um, that he does his dry plates on or, or his emulsion on. And uh, John Graybill, the great grandson of uh, Edward Curtis, he came up and we did a pot printing course here about a, right before the whole lockdown thing started. I don't know, it was March maybe? March, I guess, last month or February, I can't remember. And uh, man, I just fell in love with, and I've always loved thin glass. Every time I found an old plate holder, an old dry plate holder and pulled the glass out, you know, the Kodak or Ilford plates are always about a millimeter, a millimeter, 1.3, 1.4 millimeter thick glass. And um, kind of going back to John's point, I just feel like I get better, you know, uh, a little better times, a little more clarity. You don't have any interference you have in the glass and your prints or you're making positives. So it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, well, not so much positives, but any transmission of light. Um, I just feel like you get a better result. And I just love the, the look and feel. It's so 19th century. And uh, the wet plate processes, process versus the dry plate. Basically, dry plate is an emulsion, a film, and the wet collodion process is technically the, the silver nitrate is, is that double replacement process that happens with your two salts or three salts or one salt, whatever you have in it. That process for, forms silver halogen, light sensitive halogens on the plate. There's no um, preserving that. It has to be exposed and then processed, right? Wet collodion. So it's much slower than dry plate. And dry plate is more like film. So you're not gonna get the look and feel. You're gonna, it's gonna look more like, like a, you know, sheet film or a roll film. Uh, that was the precursor to it. And you're right, you can go up, I think he's got from two, four or 25 ISO, something like that. Um, I'm not, uh, John does all his work, his descendants projects in, on dry plate. I'm not really interested in dry plate simply for the fact um, I, I don't have any historical context to use it for the work, my work, and um, I'd probably just use film if, if I was going to go that route anyway, uh, film or digital negatives or, or something like that, because um, while it's cool and, and you can get a certain kind of aesthetic with it, it's not something that uh, I'm, I'm chased personally, so. But it's 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 great, and I, I recommend people trying to trying trying all kinds of processes and see see what what aesthetic works for works for you and and what you're trying to do with the work, versus um, you know maybe what's easiest or cheapest or or those kinds of things. Uh, let's see, John, Jan says I uh, for this photo I use two 54 watt UV L spotlights for yep 45 degree two meters away. Uh, one and a half meter exposure was five seconds at F8. Very good. That's a lot of UV light going. You stop down to F8 like that. That's a lot of light going in there. So yeah, um, ISO times uh, or times and uh, speed of film, the quality, the look and feel of the image, uh, all of those things um, matter to me. So once you get post 1910, 1920, um, especially here in America, um, you're you're going to be all that silver gelatin film look, that dry plate look, or that roll film or sheet film look. It's going to be all that way. Um, pre that, the turn of the century, eight, late 1800s is really when it started, but it took a couple of decades to catch on to go to that kind of dry sheet, dry film, and 
dry plate and um, kind of sheet film and those things. Plastic roll film came. Um, pre that was this kind of, uh, you know, collodion um, and then uh, negatives that were used to print in all variations. You know, we're, we're talking about the pictorialist movement doing this kind of stuff. We're talking about um, albumin prints, salt prints, um, all those things, you know, just it, it, it depends on, for me, it depends on historically what you're trying to connect with, aesthetically what you're trying to do with the look and feel of the photograph. And then a lot of times, um, if you want to integrate your materials, if the materials you use are important to the work and you want to integrate and talk about those, that's important to do as well. So there's a lot of the, the ritual, the process, you know, um, I'm not a process photographer. My, my work or the idea of the work's more important than that, but the process supports the work, right? Like we talked about quite a bit. And, and so it's important that you select the right image, aesthetic, process, um, all those things to match your work. So, you know, everybody's seen the uh, amusement parks or the, the, you know, old time Western, old timey Western stuff. And they have them dress up and they go in there and they shoot those things with a digital camera and then they sepia tone them and print them out. Doesn't quite work. I, you know, the idea is there, but visually it just doesn't quite work. It's that kind of example I, I usually give um, to match the aesthetic with the, the type of work or what you're trying to achieve um, uh, metaphorically or conceptually. Um, and then at the same time, there can be a lot of hidden things in, in the process that you want to share um, I, I often share the Kristallnacht in, in Europe, working on this, these uh, synagogue sites that were destroyed, and I'm pouring this solution on glass, you know, Kristallnacht glass, the night of broken glass. I'm fixing in the Zyklone B, the very compound used in the gas chambers. There's a lot of material connections. Uh, there's a lot of ritual connections, um, uh, those kinds of things. And then when you make negatives and you move beyond that and you start making prints, uh, what kind of prints are you making and why? What does that mean? What kind of paper are you using? What color are you making them or toning them? Or why are you doing those things? That all plays a role. So it's not just a quick, easy, like I'm going to pick up a camera and make a project. I mean, you can, but I think eventually as you go down and you refine that project, you're going to find you want specific uh, formats, sp uh, specific formats or uh, processes in the formats. Uh, specific types of um, output, you know, th those kinds of things. I think in the end, you you refine it. It's okay to start and say, hey, I'd like to try dry plates. I'd like to try wet collodion. I'd like to try, you know, gum by chromate prints. I'd like to try digital negatives and do carbon prints or, you know, it's, it's great. Th that exploration time is really important, but I think it's really important to have an end game for it as well too. Like, like I'm trying, I can't quite articulate what I'm looking for, but if I play in these processes and these, um, you know, formats and, and these output types, I, if, if I stumble across what I'm, you know, internally, mentally, and in my heart I'm looking for, I'll know. That's kind of what happened to me. At the turn of the century, I was looking at, uh, um, you can go see this video too, or this documentary uh, Benoit made of me in Paris. Um, uh, I talk about in the front of that documentary, I say, you know, as, uh, in around 2000, I was really disillusioned with photography and I pulled my John Zarkowski uh, uh, modern, uh, uh, Museum of Modern Art's great, 100 Greatest Photographs, I, I, some title like that. I've got it over on my shelf here, but, and I started opening up that and there's a daguerreotype and then there's a, a calotype uh, and then there's a, a, a little six plate ambrotype or positive of this, these people in this wagon, a tall hat, and this guy staring at the camera. And they, they printed it full frame, so all the imperfections and everything are there. You know, the processes, proof of process, as we say. And man, my, you know, just grabbed me. I knew what the wet collodion process was. I'd, I'd done albumin prints in the early 90s with film negatives and things in a print class that I had. Um, so I was very familiar. You know, I have an undergraduate degree in photography, so I was very familiar with the history of photography. And as I was disillusioned and trying to find a process for this uh, Portraits from Madison Avenue, that project that I did, um, man, that, that ambrotype grabbed me. And I just knew, and I started my journey down that road. And now I'm doing a little more discovery 
with my 50 plus negatives of ghost dance and wondering how and why I want to print them out. I can print them out as straight pop photographs. I have, they're great, but um, I want a little more poetry to them. I want a little more involvement with them. And this kind of stuff gets me closer to what I'm after than a straight pot print or a, you know, a straight, whatever, what we call them straight, but they're not, you know, they're still printing out processes. So that's the long turnaround of, of uh, going, should I try, you know, should you try different processes? Yes, you should. I think you should. I think it's valuable. Does anybody have anything to add to that? I think it's a great conversation to have. It's not beer, it's water. Wasser mit Gas. <laughs> what do you guys think about that? Uh, printing out that, that uh, gelatin and dichromate and, and ink. That's pretty cool. It's a pretty neat process. I think that's probably all I'm going to do on this process. Um, other than I'll get my, if I jacked up the position of the negative in the glass, I'll get my, my stuff together and I'll do another really nice um, uh, print on glass. And what I'll do is I'll ink it up. I'll let it dry. I'll, I'll control the dry on it. And then I'll do a transfer onto paper and see how that works. And I saw a young lady this morning that emailed me a video and she's, I think she's in Paris. Um, she was showing me how she does transfers and she uses a light bulb, uh, you know, like a big headed light bulb, one of those spot light bulbs. And she goes around that she puts the paper on top of the ink print. She goes around the back of the paper and kind of contact prints it that way and then peels it off. They, they look beautiful. So I may try that. Maybe we'll do that next time and see, but I'll get this stuff right. Jan, do you change something in your chemistry when you go outside in the field or do you use the same mix? Yes, great question. That's a good, good question. So Jan's asking about um, what kind of chemistry do I use in the field versus what I use in the studio or at, at you know, the north light window here or the artificial lights over here. The, the, que the, the answer is really depending on what variant you're going to use. Are you making positive images or are you making negative plates? Um, the negatives are going to require more iodide, more time, and more development time. And the positives are going to require less, fewer iodide uh, mixture or collodion, uh, less iodides in the collodion, um, a weaker bath, a higher pH in the bath, uh, more iron in the developer, less acid in the developer. Basically, for a positive image, you're, what you're doing, do I have a pot? I have a beater plate here, don't I? Yeah. Um, when you make, um, this is my marking plate, but when you make a positive image, what you're doing is you're making a very underexposed negative, a very, very thin negative. In fact, if this was on glass, you'd barely be able to see the bottles at all, right? It'd just be clear glass and I could tilt it around. And you, oh, I see something on there. Then I put it against something black and I use the light hitting it, reflecting back into your eyes. And the grain, the silver, this is metallic, pure metallic silver, the highlights, right? They reflect the light back. And even though it's very thin and there's very little of it there, if it's against black, it's going to show you an image and a nice image if it's exposed properly. The more exposure you give that, the denser, the thicker the silver gets, the more silver it applies in the midtones down to the void areas and you do it on glass, and then you put it on a piece of paper and you transmit light through it, now you're talking about making a negative and a print. So the negative requires a, 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 a higher pH, a more alkaline or more basic pH, and more silver, and a highly iodized collodion, meaning it's gonna take on the maximum amount of silver you can get on that plate. You're gonna go for a longer exposure, and your development time is gonna be a lot longer. So you're gonna reduce the iron, and increase the acid in your developer for negatives. So you pull out the maximum information on that plate you can. You're not doing that with positives. You're gonna go for a quick hit. It's just a quick, like underexposed. Think of it as a Polaroid, just a tick, you know, shake it, shake it, there it is, you know. It's, it's not refined, it's not uh, specialized. You're just gonna use reflected light against something black and show that image. So these, you know, in the 19th century, you're called an ambrotypist or a tintypist. To be called a photographer, you need to make negatives. So there was a little more understanding. These were quick, one-off, great sellers, great for commerce, uh, tin types, you know, you can bend and carry them around in your pocket and all that kind of stuff like those old boys did. 
um, uh, great for putting in little 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 uh, uh, gems, putting in in photo albums and stuff like that. They were durable. They didn't break. They weren't glass. So most of the time, they made ferrotypes or tintypes or glass negatives. And the glass negatives were generally printed on albumin paper, made CDBs or carte de vistas or you know some other uh, type of print like that. But at the end of the day, the two chemistries are very different in the sense of um, very different in in res in 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 pen or uh, anticipated results. Uh, but to answer the question, can I use my positive developer to make negatives? Yep, I can. I can use my collodion. I can use my developer, and I can use my fix, and I can make negatives. Will they be at maximum level? The best possible chance I have to make the best possible negative? No, because you have too much iron, not enough acid in the developer. You don't have enough, usually you don't have enough iodide in the, in the collodion, unless it's old red collodion, then, then you're pretty much the same. Um, and and uh, at the end of the day, what you're looking for, for with positives is a fast, quick, fast exposure, a 15 second development, bam, reflected light on something black. With negatives, you're looking to extend that range and go way out there. That's why prints are so beautiful, right? They just extend that range way out there. And um, so you want the highly iodized collodion, the silver bath, it has more silver in it and a, and a more a higher pH to take on that, that, that double replacement. You'll pack a little more silver on there. You don't need that silver on a positive. And then the developer, less iron and more acid. The iron will reduce those halogens to the pure metallic state of silver and the acid will keep the unexposed silver from developing. So you can develop a negative. My negatives are usually developed in a minute, a minute and a half, sometimes two minutes development time. So it's a different process with a different end result. Your, my, negatives, um, my negatives don't look good as positives. They look awful as positives. And my positives print terribly as negatives. That's, that's the catch, right? So you have to pick one or the other. Um, I always talk about the middle road, this bright ambrotype thing that I talk about. And the bright ambrotype is an overexposed positive that still looks quite good as a positive. It's bright and you probably lose a, quite a bit of detail with the reflected light. But a lot of times it will print on some of these less demanding printing out processes. So I, I, I vary the two and it prints out great on like developing out paper, Kodak, Ilford, things like that. So I've, I've committed years ago to completely going one way or the other. I haven't made positives in a very, very long time. All I've done is negatives. So, uh, Quinn. Yes, please, Jan. Uh, here in Norway, we have uh, normal 10 degrees, uh, 15 degrees outside. Yes. And it's very cold. So I think about a little more uh, alcohol in developer to get better flow. And because it's developer is very cold, you have to often go from 15, 16 seconds to 17 seconds. I okay. think about the temperature. Yes, it's that's right. Are, are you making positives or are you talking about making positives? Uh, we start with positives. I okay. think I got the negative. Here's the problem with adding too much alcohol to your developer. And this is something that's uh, come about. You can read it in the old literature. But when you, I tell people to experiment with how much alcohol you need in your developer because it can be very uh, problematic, especially for density. Um, and it can also create more problems with your silver bath. You're adding more solvents and, and thing, uh, water and uh, basically solvent into your, your bath. Um, so at the end of the day, you wanna use as little alcohol as you need. Um, cool temperatures, um, you know, 10 degrees uh, Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit should, should work great in collodion and love those temperatures, you know, uh, 50 Fahrenheit to 68 Fahrenheit, really good temperatures, you know, 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, great for collodion. I recommend people not using so, too much alcohol in their developer now, just for the simple fact you lose density. Um, a lot of times um, the alcohol and additional solvents in the silver bath can cause model marks and, and really, if you smell your silver bath and it smells like alcohol or ether, you know you need to let that aerate. You'll start getting model marks and stuff on your plates. So, but that's a good one. Um, Sean says, hi, Quinn, general wet plate. If you're using an all alcohol collodion, can you reconstitute your pour bottle with just alcohol? Um, here's the thing, that's a great question too, Sean. 
the alcohol, so what he's talking about is I recommend people having a pour bottle and a drain bottle for your collodion. Why is that? Well, because your pour bottle, it doesn't matter the size of the plate. When you pour that collodion out on a plate, that ether starts to evaporate. You can watch it. If you hold the plate up eye level, you can see that ether pull up and, and pull off. So when you drain that off into the same bottle, you, the, 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 the constitution or the amount of ether in the uh, collodion on the plate is different than what you're pouring back in the bottle. And if you did that with 250 milliliter bottle and never drained it into a drain bottle, your collodion is going to be much thicker. It, the, vis, the viscosity of it's going to change tremendously because um, you didn't drain it into a separate bottle or a drain bottle. Um, secondly, if you're out outdoors and you're pouring plates, it's a good idea to have a drain bottle simply for the fact if you have a bug or something or dirt blow, wind blow up and you drain that off back into your pour bottle, now you have all that junk in your pour bottle. So a drain bottle, you can filter it. And more importantly, you can reconstitute, Sean's asking, you can reconstitute it with your solvents. And he asked, if I make an all alcohol collodion, meaning I don't add any additional ether to it, I put the 80 mils of collodion, or 80 mils of alcohol, 80 mils of ether, I put substitute the 80 mils of ether with 80 mils of alcohol. <clears throat> One thing that does is it increases the water volume in your collodion, and you can do two things. It can create a lot of crepey lines, or crepe paper lines, or chambered lines, or um, all kinds of stuff. Model marks, the same thing I was just talking about the developer. Alcohol is great, but it can cause problems in excess. And secondly, your all alcohol collodion can be very tender, like wet toilet paper. You put a cotton ball on it to wipe that, that excess undeveloped, uh, that unexposed developed silver off, and you just pull it right off the plate. Sometimes, it just depends. Um, but you can use it. And if you can't get ether, definitely do all alcohol collodion. Now, his question is, is can I reconstitute this drain bottle with all alcohol, um, uh, all alcohol collodion? Can I use alcohol to reconstitute it? Here's the problem with that. I'm now recommending, I used to recommend 50-50 ether and alcohol to reconstitute your drain bottle. I'm cutting back on the alcohol because of the water, uh, or because the water doesn't evaporate like ether does. Ether evaporates. That's what gums up your poor bottle collodion. So you can, I wouldn't use 10%, I'd use about 5% of alcohol versus 10%. So I say, if you have a 125 mil bottle, Drain bottle, use 12 and a half mils alcohol and 12 and a half mils ether. I've changed that to five mils of alcohol and 12 and a half mils of ether. So you get more ether and you're reconstituted because that's what you lose out of here more than the alcohol. The alcohol doesn't evaporate like that. But you might be okay with the all alcohol collodion not even adding, you know, 5%, maybe only 2%. You just have to see. If your collodion starts getting gummy and it's not flowing well, you want your collodion to flow very well. You don't want to have, you don't want to have ridges. You don't want to have lumps and, and curls and twists in it. Once you have those, you know that your, the, the, the viscosity of your collodion is off and you need to add solvents. And if you're using all alcohol, you know, the only thing you can add is alcohol, but add little bits at a time because that's 95% ethanol and 5% water. And you've got to keep that in mind, water, as they say in the old literature, is injurious to collodion. So, so be careful of that. Other than, Drew says, other than exposure adjustments, are there other effects on negative making when using thicker, thinner glass? No, no. It doesn't matter what thickness of glass you're making. That's for more what I was talking about, John uh, mentioned earlier, about the uh, penetration of UV through certain glass. That's for printing. Making the negative, you're on the surface. It doesn't matter. You're talking about the chemistry. Uh, the light, the optics, um, the conditions there to expose the plate for maximum density without overexposing. Um, uh, sometimes we, we can re revisit this, but I, I talk about there's a line. If you were out here to make the perfect negative and you don't know what this exposure is, this is exposure X, and you run a positive plate, and that positive plate is five seconds, it looks good, it's got tonal range, I'd go to seven or eight seconds, time and a half or so on exposure. Some people say twice that time. Um, I'd start with time and a half. 
And if I get a good negative that I can redevelop, I can step up to that and make the perfect negative through chemistry, adding those two or three seconds. Because if I, if I think I can, if I don't know what this X factor is out here and I overstep it a second or two seconds, I've overexposed that negative. Now I've lost all the density. Now it's not recoverable. You're past the point of throw the plate away, wipe it, whatever. Because once you cross that exposure threshold, there's no recovering it. Yes, if you can, if you can uh, reconstitute with 99% alcohol, it does. That absolutely right. And I'd start with 5% and see where you go. Because uh, um, the ether helps. Um, and you have a lot of, do you have 70 plus percent of ether in your collodion anyway? Um, the ether helps with adherence and, and drying and the alcohol will help um, with, uh, with the flow as well too, as that ether evaporates. So yeah, the higher percentage alcohol you can do, the better if you can get out of that water situation. So good deal. Yeah. Mint drain ball. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. So no, no exposure adjustments other than, um, of walking that up to, we don't know what that perfect exposure for a negative is. People always ask me, why do you always redevelop your negatives? And I say, because I walk up to that, get close to that perfect exposure and I come back to the dark room or, or in my lab and I, I chemically add those two or three seconds, whatever I might need. Once in a great while, if I'm in the studio here and I have time to play and the light's not changing too much, I can hit a foundation negative right on. I don't need redevelopment, I don't need anything. But most of the time, I'll step even a second. I'll just do one cup redevelopment, pounce that negative up, and, and, and there it is. It prints perfectly on, on the processes. This is drying down nicely. It's getting a little more uh, depth to it, a little more detail. I love it. I'll roll some black over it tomorrow, see what, what we get. Not a question, but may I show you the wet plates that got me into the world? Yes! Where are you? Where are you, Linda? Let's pull Linda up. There she is. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for joining us. Please show us. I, I actually bought my first picture that I saw. Beautiful. So, Look at that, a clip and, ferrotype. And can you show us the back of that? Can you mm -hmm. turn that around? You see that? That's an authentic baked ferrotype. That's not an alumatite. Yeah, beautiful. And this one. Gorgeous. I can see why that got you into that. Can mm -hmm. you show us the back of that one as well? The one on your right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Like beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Look at that. So. And look at the color difference in them too, right? The one is warm yeah. and creamy and the other one's more silvery. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, the the uh, two reasons. Uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. the type of fix they, they used and how much a uh, developer they used on the plate. So the one in your left hand, the gentleman on the bent, the one with his hands between his leg, not cross leg, but open leg, <laughs> yeah. um, he yeah. was probably fixed in cyanide. And he have a little Prussian okay. blue on the side of the plate as well too, that indicates that. And it's a warm yeah. color. And he probably used right. very little developer. And the, the less developer mm -hmm. you use and the more silver you keep on the plate. And if you use KCN as the fix, the warmer tones you're gonna get in your positives. That's beautiful. Cool. Yeah. And do you see here the lady? Yes. Look at that. Okay. Oh, wow. So cool. Aren't they great? So, and you know why I just that had to show you. Linda, do you know why that corner's clipped on that plate? I think that's uh, why. Well, they hold it here, right? Actually, it's to slip it into a photo album. Mm -hmm. It's to slip the corner okay. into a photo album. Yeah, that's why they clip the corners cool. on the, those. Yeah, great cool. plates. I have to show you. <laughs> Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, feel free mm -hmm. to share this stuff, guys, because it's always Thank neat you. to see what people are into, what got them excited about a process, or what, what, what they enjoy aesthetically. I mean, that says a lot about Linda right there. I mean, those are beautiful um, uh, portraits. I'm primarily a portrait guy, and if I had my druthers, I'd rather... Um, I'd probably rather make images of people than, than most anything else. It's just, I don't know. I shouldn't say that because some days I really, I really love uh, still life or doing the, uh, um, you know, scene, you know, landscapes. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not as proficient as those types of images as I think I am with portraiture work, but I love it all. Hey, as, if we're pouring plates or making photographs, we're happy, right? I mean, 
that's the idea. What else we got? Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? I have a question. Please, Tim, shoot. This is for you. This is for you or for anybody, but yeah. What is it? Not to not to focus on the negative, <laughs> pun intended. What <laughs> frustrates you about this whole wet plate process the most? Is it dealing with people? Is it dealing with chemistry? Is it getting supplies and making equipment? What is it that frustrates you more than anything else? That's a great question. You guys jump in there and answer that, and I'll get in at the end. I'll get. I'll answer last. Somebody else get in there and ask. Answer that question. That's an open question. Nothing frustrates me about this process. I get into the process because I love nerding out about this whole thing. <laughs> I a question earlier about light transmission. Those are I, I'm I'm like engineer nerd by 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 default, and art is. I mean, that's what my actual degree is in. So yeah, and I it, the more complicated things get, the more challenging. The more I love it. And that's that's one thing that brought me to this process. In addition to the look and the grainless, the the, the ultra realistic uh, features of wet plate to begin with. So I don't think great great point. Else. Good good commentary there. I totally agree that the and just think about it, guys. The ISO uh, what he what John just mentioned. You go from the ISO. Let's say I love Kodachrome back in the day. ISO twenty five. You know. Uh, T Max 100, those slower films. You think about those are really nice grain structure. Think about ISO one, just like you said, this ultra realistic kind. Of, if you're after that, Clodian is the way to go. That's a great, great answer. Who's who's that? Who, who else? What frustrates you? Like Tim's asking, what 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 gets at your gall? Nothing. You you all love it and you're totally into it. I, I get that. I think what frustrates me the most is uh, is the uh, I, I want to do so much and I don't have the time to do it. And that's probably why I'm enjoying this uh, coronavirus time so much is because it's literally given me the chance. And, and I'm, I'm going to do this, you guys. You're going to see this body of work come out of this. Once I nail down exactly what I want to do, um, you're going to see this body of work. So the most frustrating thing to me is it so time consuming the things that I want to do in it and I don't have generally don't have the time to do it. So, and I can't do this full time, right? This is not practical to, to say, Oh, uh, I don't need to earn any money. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm out here floating in the nebulous just fine. No, I got to earn money just like everybody else. And so frustrating to me is God, I want to go down there and work on that. And I can't, I got to do this or, I, I want to dedicate the next three days to that. Oh, I can't, I, I got to do this, you know? Mm -hmm. So time constraints, not, I'm with John, nothing else. Absolutely love to nerd out on it. I, I'm always learning something about it. I'm always exploring um, what, what it is that I want to do, accomplish technically uh, for aesthetic purposes and then conceptual purposes on. I always have that goal in mind of saying, wow, I should, I should pursue this for a little while. And it's, it's a time factor for me, for sure. <clears throat> I, I, let me mention something here, guys, and, and we'll go back to Tim's question here if somebody else wants to jump in. I have received one phone call and one text in the last week, I guess, um, um, about photographers closing down shop, wet clothing photographers closing down shop. And it really frustrated me. It really bothered me. Um, the calls were in, in regards to chemistry, either storing chemistry, getting rid of chemistry, how to handle this stuff, and blah, 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 right? It doesn't, doesn't really matter about what they were about. But it really started getting uh, to me about people. Um, and then I also got a couple of emails about people having problems getting product. I mean, from rubber gloves and paper towels to, you know, the, the actual chemistry, the compound. Um, I don't think anyone that I know of, uh, Mike at Artcraft or Cam Savers or anybody like that, or even UV Photographics, I don't know that they're having any problems because I've got a stock load of stuff here, so I haven't ordered. But what bothered me were the people that were closing shop down, right? That, that business has stopped for everybody. The world stopped. Um, I've got my house up for sale right now. And we had showings up until about a week ago. And the realtor called me yesterday afternoon. He said, hey, Quinn, how's it going? I said, oh, I'm doing good. And uh, just had a little chat. And I said, well, we were having uh, showings right up until about a week ago, I guess Easter weekend and 
the weather, we had a couple of storms and got kind of cold. I said, that's probably what is slowing down. And he said, oh no, um, they came out with uh, some real estate board and the state came out with uh, this law or this recommendation that you can't have in-person house showings. I was like, what? Yeah, we can't show your house. You can't have people into your house to look. It's like, wow. So between the people closing down their shops, businesses, businesses stopping, um, and the last thing we need to have in this, these processes are people not making the photographs. I know these guys were for commercial stuff, but they, they, you know, they did their stuff on the side. But to lose people out of the process, and people ask me this often, they say, and it kind of reminded me about with Tim's question is what people don't like about the process. It ebbs and flows. Over the last two decades, people come in, they make a splash, and a few years later, they're gone. You know, there's only been a, a, a you know, I can count on one hand if I take, you know, three fingers away and a thumb. Um, there's only been a, a very few people that's, that's ridden this stuff out. And it, not economically either, just people come to a point where they have nothing left to say, they don't garner an audience, somebody else is doing something cooler or more interesting and people ebb and flow. So my advice to you is don't burn out on the process. Don't, uh, don't throw all your eggs in one basket. Have a reason to work in it. Um, enjoy it, enjoy the journey, enjoy the exploration of it all. Uh, but don't hang your hat on one spike on the wall, so to speak, because everybody comes in and they're the rock star. And then a couple of years later, nobody knows who they are. I could give you example after example after example of this. It's just, we call it progress and, and I call it, you know, you know who's in the game for the right reasons and who aren't. And I'm, 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 I'm still, I'm not saying these guys going out of business is a good thing in any shape, way or form, but I'm just saying they hung their hat on kind of one thing and, and now they just want to, you know, turn it all over and I'm done with it. And it's, you know, I said, well, what are, one of them, I said, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to, I'm going to take a welding course. I said, okay, okay. That's all right. You know, so from wet clothing photographer to welder. So back to Tim's question. Anybody else got anything they, what, what frustrates you in the process? Anything? For me, it's, it's more uh, equipment. My, hey, my Pat, main good camera, you, good to see you. My main camera that I've been doing practicing wet plate on is a, a large, well, my 14 studio camera that obviously I can't take outdoors. Yeah. Um, I've got a uh, crown graphic that I adapted a couple weeks ago to be able to do four by five plates in it and went outdoors in the backyard and took a couple photos. Uh, but I don't have a portable dark room, so I can't, even once Corona's lifted, I can't, you know, go wherever outside and take pictures. So uh, that's for me was the most frustrating part. Honestly, you, I, I was going to say without, now I can say it, I was going to say, I'm surprised somebody hasn't chimed in about not being able to get out of their their space and travel yeah. because at some point after you get the process down, especially making positives, Hey, I want to get out of this little space and I want to go out to the mountain. I want to go out to the hill. I want to go out to their city. I want to, I want to travel around and do something with the process. And, and, and it is frustrating because you have to have the camera, the gear, you're working in public. It's really weird now, at least in America, it is uh, people, you know, cops and security look at you weird. So that's a great point. I'm surprised not more people say that, because I know I felt that when I first got in, um, I, uh, it took me, you know, several years before I had any uh, making positives were in, in a studio or in my confined area was any problem. But at some point in time, you like, I can only photograph this so many times, right? And I can yeah. only photograph people coming over when they show up or just being mobile uh, meant, meant a, a big deal. So that's a great mm -hmm. point. Thanks for sharing that, Pat. That's a good point. What else, guys? Anybody else? It's a good conversation. That's that's good. It's a good good to know. Well, what do you think about this? Um, I'm going to um, take recommendations. It's Saturday. Uh, we come in on Wednesday. If if we want to do a Wednesday show I, or we want to meet on Wednesday, definitely won't want to do that. Um, I will. I won't take the show. We'll just come in and do a Q and A or something on Wednesday. If you guys want to do that, uh, share whatever. Turn it over to you guys. I will um, do some more glass plates between now and then. I guarantee it. 
And I think I'm going to end up, I think I'm going to end up playing with that um, Strathmore paper more. I think that uh, it's drying down nice now. Look at that. Yeah, it really is. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. So classic oil printing. I'm so happy you guys joined me. I thank you so much for coming in and spending time mostly in my world. It's a wonderful thing. I greatly appreciate all of you. And thank you for everybody that's bought my book and supported me and done all that. I thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and if you haven't seen this, I did a portfolio review. Um, it's up on YouTube on my YouTube channel. Go take a look at it if you have some time and you want to uh, kind of deep dive on my nerdiness in the conceptual area. Go take a look at that and find out the reasons I've made the work that I've made. Because at the end of the day, like I say in the presentation, if, if the creator or the person's making work, I think it's their responsibility to be able to defend that work and talk about it. And I know defend, it sounds, sounds drastic, but basically talk about the work and answer questions about the work. And if you're not in that pro stage yet, come in and let's have discourse and dialogue about where you're at. That'd be a good topic for next time. And I'll show you, I'll show you any, uh, anything that I've done and people can share what they're doing. I'm seriously, as of now, I'm starting to work on this, uh, this little 20 piece project that I'm gonna put that body of work together. And I'm, I'm feeling like it might be on glass. That's what I'm feeling like it might be on glass. But um, every paper I do, I get turned on by, so I'm not really sure. So, no book yet, Jan, are you kidding me? Oh my good. We sent his book to Norway um, over, it's gotta be coronavirus. Uh, Quinn. Yes. You stopped it for uh, one month ago. Ah. Yes. And I ask uh, the Norwegian Post system, and I say, America had sent the post with boat. And the last time it was in San Francisco. And if you go with boat from San Francisco, Panama Canal, over to uh, Netherlands, yeah. containers. And then you have to logistic to take it out again. So it's like three, four months. Oh my God. And be, but why? And I think about if I not get the book, something will happen. I want to um, they get, one more book in safe. <laughs> I, 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 I sent those books priority. So USPS ships that priority, meaning it goes on an airplane to Europe. And I know, I know that it arrived in the post in Norway. I saw that. It arrived there. Now, the, the question is, and it says it's in route to your place. The question is, is what have they done? Are they worried about coronavirus? Are they worried about, uh, um, um, you know, the taxes, the uh, import duties? Or what are they worried about? You know, that's what I wonder. Uh, normally, uh, old post, I got the lands from uh, Ukraine now. Okay. It took only seven days. So Norwegian post system, not problems with uh, Corona. They work, working, okay. working, working. Okay, but good. I think it's a, a problem in uh, Schiphol and uh, in uh, Kastrup, uh, Denmark. Okay. We will stay on that. And worst case scenario, I will send you a PDF so you can read it. And, yes, and I hope so, you, because... Uh, if you have to wait I three will... or four months, that's ridiculous, so... <laughs> yes. Well, hang in there, okay. guys. Have, stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay happy. Have a wonderful day. And all my best. Thank you so much. Thank you, Russia. Thank you, I appreciate it. Michelle, Thilo, um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Matthias, thank you, brother. John, everybody. Jan, Drew, you guys are great. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Ciao.